all throughout time. Amen. Aren't you glad that we serve a God like that for those of you who are already saved? Come on. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good to see you, bro. All right, so let's get into the Word. I've got about 15 minutes to preach, and then we're going to receive uh, another time of ministry. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond to the message. And by the way, if you're just being stirred up in your spirit, you don't even have to wait till I'm done preaching. If you want someone to pray for you, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're tired of your sin, if you're tired of being uh, alone, if you're tired of being guilty and shame-filled, and you want to have salvation, you don't have to wait. I love the woman with the issue of blood. She said, if I could just touch... Jesus Christ, I'll be made whole. Amen? You see, and that's the kind of faith that makes God happy. That bold faith. Amen. All right. So pray with me. Father, help in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, we just sort of notice that every power of Satan on this campus, you're defeated. You're destroyed. All your lives are being crushed under the gospel. Jesus Christ has defeated you. He's risen from the grave. And Lord, we just give you all the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, so you guys can help me preach. You can say amen. You can shout. You can get excited. Uh, I've been to a Cal Berkeley football game on more than one occasion, so don't act like you don't know how to do that. Okay? Yeah! <laughs> All right. How many of you guys know that, that Jesus is fun, the church is fun, that the gospel is fun? Can I get an amen to that? Woo! Maybe you were raised in a crusty religious Jesus! environment where you didn't feel any love, you didn't feel any power, you didn't see anyone ever get healed, you never heard God speaking to you, you were never taught that Jesus Christ is alive, that he's for today. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really genuinely am sorry that you had that experience. But we just want to present to you the real Jesus today, amen? So come on and get it. Hallelujah. All right, so today's message is called, If I Be Lifted Up. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of John in the 12th chapter. I'm reading out of the NIV, and uh, I'm starting at verse 30. I'm sorry, at verse... 20. John chapter 12, John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 30, the NIV 84, it says this. Uh, this is Jesus speaking, and he is speaking shortly before his crucifixion. John chapter 12, and verse 20, it says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. Well, the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven came. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said that it thundered. Others said that an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now, the prince of this world is driven out. Hallelujah. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, as is always the case with God's word, there's so much to preach and so little time. And so I want to talk to you today about this message. 
with I be lifted up. You see, what's interesting about this passage is that Greeks had come to see Jesus. You see, Greeks were not a part of Israel. Just to give you an itty bitty little bit of history here, Israel celebrated the Passover feast every year because of God's deliverance. And normally it was celebrated by the Jews, but if you study the Old Testament law, you'll see that God is merciful. You'll see that God has always been reaching out to the nations from the beginning of time that anyone who calls on his name out of a pure heart who desires to keep his covenant, he will receive them. Come on, somebody get a revelation of that. And so these Greeks are there at this feast that they came from a faraway country to worship the Lord and they had heard about Jesus and they said, we want to see this guy. We want to see this Messiah. And this is the context for this whole, this whole passage that we just read. And so Jesus is talking about that he came for this very purpose, to fall to the ground like a grain of wheat and die so that he could produce an abundance of seeds, an abundance of life. And he concludes with this amazing statement. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Amen. And so the first question I'd like to propose to you, and the first question that comes to my mind is why does Jesus have to die? I don't know if you've ever thought about that question, but I want to answer that because I feel like there's some people in this atmosphere that don't have the answer to that question. They don't know why Jesus had to die. And so, by the way, again, I'm, I'm assuming most of you through culture have know of this already, but when Jesus is talking about being lifted up, he's talking about the kind of death he would die, he's talking about the death of the cross, okay? He's predicting exactly how he is going to suffer to pay for the debt that mankind owes. And so the question then is this, why must the Son of Man be lifted up? Why did he have to die? So I want to make three points in my message, and then I'm going to, by the grace of God, try to be done in ten minutes. I want to talk today about the compulsion to sin. The compulsion to sin. And then I'm going to talk about the curse of sin. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at the cure for sin. Okay? So Jesus said this, that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And again, I can't get into the context, but that even goes back to the Exodus when Moses lifted up a serpent in the desert, you can read it for yourself in the book of Exodus. So there's so much prophecy and so much depth to everything Jesus says that it would take hours and hours and hours to fully unpack this. And so I want to give you guys an example. I have a two-year-old niece whose name is Eden. Uh, my brother Nick is here with me, so praise God, he's my witness. And this little niece is very, very cute. Very, very cute. She gets away with a lot because she's cute. Come on, some of you guys, some of you guys do too. If you guys are getting away with stuff, you shouldn't because you're cute. And uh, so this niece is very cute, but uh, and she, she really likes to tell everybody else what they should be doing. Oh, no, 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 you need to go and get that for me. Oh, no, 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 we're going to go to the park now. Oh, no, 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 come and walk with me. No, 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 I want to watch this now. She's very good at giving orders to people. Uh, except then when you tell her what to do, she doesn't want to listen. When you say no, you're not going to watch that right now. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's what she does. And, and way worse. No, 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 you're not going to play with that right now. Uh -huh. Come on. Any, anybody else know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen a two-year-old? Do you have a two-year-old? Have you raised a two-year-old? Okay? It's kind of a funny example, but you see, I want you to understand this truth. That deep within humanity, there is a compulsion to sin. Okay, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to give a very brief history. Going all the way back to the beginning, Genesis 3. God creates man and woman perfectly in his image, gives them everything that you could desire, everything you ever needed, and he just said one thing, just here's a boundary line, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't do it. And so what do they do? They disobey God's command. You know, and so sin is nothing more than a refusal to accept boundaries, than a refusal to accept that when God or an authority figure gives you a command or a boundary that you're not supposed to cross it, that's why it's called a trespass. Have you ever walked onto property that you didn't own, that you weren't supposed to be there? That's called trespassing, because you're crossing a boundary that you shouldn't. 
You see, and a lot of people get super offended at God. They get offended that he says, don't commit sexual immorality, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal. They get offended because they don't want to have to keep that boundary themselves, but then ironically, hypocritically, if somebody rolls into their house and, you know, steals their TV, if somebody takes their girlfriend and cheats on them, Preach then it. they're angry. They are furious. They want to drop the guillotine, right? Come on, you guys know that I'm preaching That's the truth. Good. Just come on. Just go ahead and mind your heads. Let, let, let's be in agreement here. So what is this thing? Okay, I would like to propose to you, it is the compulsion to sin. And the Bible says that it is within every man and every woman on planet Earth. Amen? All right, if you have your Bible still out, go ahead and go to Romans chapter 5. You know, and I was with a, uh, a young lady from this campus recently, and I'm not going to obviously give her name, but she was confessing to me that just recently, you know, she went out to a party, and she just got so drunk, and she just got so wasted, and like, passed out. She didn't even know what happened. And she woke up with a hangover, feeling just dirty, guilty, shameful, you know, and it's like, there's a compulsion and she even said to me, she said, I don't know why I do that. I don't know why I do that. I'm going to tell you why. Because there's a compulsion to sin inside of you and inside of me. Okay? Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sin. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin was not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. So the word teaches us this, that since the beginning of time, our greatest ancestors sinned, and therefore sin has entered the human race, and that is why we have a compulsion to sin. So now that you see that we have it, now that you are just getting honest with yourself that you have that compulsion to lie, you have that compulsion to cheat, you have that compulsion to be selfish, you have that compulsion to chew that person out when they offend you, what do you do about it? And what is, what's the consequence? So I want to talk about the curse of sin, okay? The curse of sin. I don't know uh, what word or uh, what images come to mind when you hear that word curse. Maybe you're thinking of the Blair Witch Project. Maybe you're thinking of like people with a, you know, a pentagram around their necks or something like that. But I, I just want to unpack this for you. A curse is a punishment. A curse is a force that works against you. Okay, and, and again, just for the sake of time, I can't go into all the detail, but the Bible says in the law that those who break the law, those who sin, are under a curse. Okay, you want to know why you're depressed? You want to know why uh, STDs are in this world? You want to know why uh, there's broken relationships? It's because sin brings a curse. Okay, it brings destruction. It brings death. It brings division. It brings pain and suffering. And you see, it's ironic because we like to blame God for our pain and our suffering. It's like somebody shooting themselves in the foot and then going and blaming the gun manufacturer for making the gun. Okay, and so humanity has to take ownership of its own sinfulness. That is a core foundational truth for you to receive the gospel. As soon as you say, I'm not a sinner, I don't need God, I, I don't need His laws, I didn't do anything wrong, you are, first of all, you're lying to yourself, and secondly, there's no way you're going to ever receive forgiveness or healing. So I'm talking about the curse of sin. What kind of curse is that? How about sickness and disease? You ever wonder why everyone on planet Earth dies? 
You know that God lives forever, and if we were made in his image, do you know that you and I were made to live forever? And do you know that that's why everyone fears death? Because deep inside of yourself, there's something that says, I'm not supposed to stop existing. I'm supposed to keep going on. I don't want to stop existing. And that's why you fear death. Because you were actually made in the image of God, and you were made to live forever. But sin has cursed you. You're under the curse of sin. That's where sickness and disease and cancer and AIDS and leprosy and all kinds of foul diseases come from. It's from sin and it's from the devil. How about the curse of division and relationships? I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday. He says, I haven't spoken to my brother in over 20 years because we got offended with each other. Because he hurt me or I hurt him and we just, we just stopped talking. You see, sin brings a curse. It brings division. It brings loneliness. It brings shame. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they were ashamed of themselves. They wanted to run away from God. And that's what many of you are doing at the sound of my voice. You're running away from God because you feel ashamed. Okay? But Jesus is coming to take away that shame. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, it's interesting to me that there is a natural shame when people sin. There's a natural shame if you commit adultery. There's a natural shame if you commit homosexual acts. And that's why... The whole gay movement is talking about gay pride because they're trying to undo the curse of their own sin. They're trying to undo the fact that sin causes shame, and they know it. And in their spirit, they know it. And so they're saying pride because they're trying to come against the very curse that their sin is bringing. But I've got news. No gay pride parade can remove your shame. But there is one who can, amen? And by the way, I'm not picking on you. I'm just using that as an example. All sin brings shame, okay? Doesn't matter where your background is. Maybe your sin is pride. Maybe your sin is greed. Maybe your sin is a, a gossiping tongue and a slanderous tongue. Okay, that kind of stuff is shameful. And it brings a curse. The Bible talks about in Revelation chapter 20 that the final curse is a horrific place called hell. It's a, a lake of burning sulfur. It's a, a place of unthinkable torment, and that is where the devil and the wicked and the evil will spend eternity. Okay, that sounds like bad news, and it is. But the good news is this, is that every single person at the sound of my voice is loved by God because he has sent me here to proclaim the way of salvation. Amen? Come on. I can name that, please. Come on, Brad. So we talked about the compulsion to sin. We talked about the curse of sin. And lastly, I want to talk about the cure of sin. And if I can have the uh, worship team come back up, I know we got to begin transitioning in about five to seven minutes here. You see, uh, turn with me in Galatians, to the book of Galatians in the third chapter, if you have a Bible. In verse 13, I'll be reading just verses 13. <laughs> and 14. Actually, I'm sorry, uh, verses 10 through 14. This is Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to go ahead and read it right now. It says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles yes! through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. I'm talking about the desire of all nations today, you guys. Come on. Is there anybody listening in the audience? Does anybody have ears to hear today? Okay, we talk about the compulsion of sin, the curse of sin. What is the cure of sin? The cure of sin is this, that the Son of God, nobody took his life from him. The Word says that he gave his life freely. He had the power to lay it down, and he had the power to bring it up once again from the grave. The Bible says this in John 12, that if I be lifted up, I will draw 
all men unto myself. You see, the blood of Jesus, Jesus became the curse that you deserve. Jesus took upon himself the whippings and the piercings and the shame and the rejection. When he was lifted up on that cross, he was suspended between heaven and earth. Even his own heavenly father rejected him for a season. It said that the sky was turned into darkness because the sin that is upon you and was upon me was placed onto him. And so the question to you today is, do you want to bear the curse of your own sin? Or are you willing to come to the foot of this cross and come to receive this one Jesus who is called the desire of nations? And he says that I am able to forgive you of your sins. The Bible says his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. So that's you. We want you to come on forward. Jesus Christ is the desire of nations. He loves you. He gave his life for you so that you could have eternal life. Amen? You see, and the good news is he didn't stay in the grave, but the Bible also says on the third day, he what? Rose again. He what? Rose again. That's the God I want to serve. I don't know about you. I don't want to serve a dead Buddha. I don't want to serve a dead Mohammed. I don't want to serve dead politics or dead atheism. I want to serve a living God. Amen. I want to serve a God that loves me. I want to serve a God that died for me. I want to serve a God who has power to raise me up when this mortal body is dust. Because the Bible says, from dust we came, to dust we will return. That's the God I want to serve. How about you? Can I get a witness in the audience? Amen. Amen. So that's you. Uh, please come to one of these tables. We're going to have a ministry team. We're just going to sing one or two more worship songs. I know we're probably right at the time limit now. Uh, but God bless you, and I pray that this message penetrated your heart, that it shifted the way you look at things, and that it helped explain to you why Jesus Christ was lifted up. Amen? Isn't it good news? Come on. Isn't it rightly called good news? Amen. Worship team.